All right, so while I'm talking about monarchs or milkweed, you can substitute whatever you prefer to think about, whether it's streams or some other species, because um, this is kind of a context for a particular issue that we can talk about. But exactly what we're monitoring doesn't really influence the issue itself. Likewise, I'm going to be talking about integrating citizen science with our grid space design. But instead of citizen science, you can think about targeted sites, like Steve was talking about, or any other site that's kind of non-randomly chosen or that doesn't follow your grid design or whatever design you're using. All right, we have a pointer here. <laughs> All right, so I'll just give you a little background on this particular monitoring program. I don't intend to go into too much detail, but feel free to ask questions afterwards if there's something I missed that you want to understand more about. Um, so the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program was sort of spawned by the Monarch Conservation Science Partnership to look at why are monarchs declining. Uh, we know from counts on the overwintering grounds where they congregate to hibernate, so it's somewhat easier to count them there, um, but they declined by 85% for the population that winters in Mexico to about 95% for the population that winters in California. And those are both over about 20 year time periods. So pretty precipitous decline. And we don't really understand why that's the case. Um, so the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program wants to monitor monarchs in the breeding areas as opposed to the overwintering areas where they've been counted for a number of years. And not only try to monitor trends, but try to monitor also some of the things that might be affecting those trends. So abundance of milkweed. Um, monarch caterpillars can only eat milkweed. And milkweed has been disappearing from agricultural areas with the adoption of glyphosate tolerant crops. Glyphosate is an herbicide, you spray the crop. It doesn't, it doesn't kill the crop, but it kills anything else that's around the crop field, including milkweed. So agricultural areas used to be really productive breeding areas for monarchs, and now most of that milkweed is gone. We think, you know, it's kind of one person in Iowa happened to monitor a couple fields to kind of document the disappearance of milkweed. But we really don't understand that very well. So the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program wants to monitor monarchs and milkweed to kind of get at these questions of why are monarchs declining and also what can we do about it. So the focal area for this project <coughs> is basically the continent. <coughs> so we're thinking pretty big. <laughs> but then we've also divided the continent into some um, regions of interest. <laughs> and these regions were identified by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as they're considering the monarchs for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And these regions take into account the annual cycle of the butterflies, so the Okay, so the eastern population breeds in kind of these more purpley areas and winters in central Mexico at the hibernation colonies there. So in the spring, they move up from Mexico through kind of this is like the migration corridor. Some of them head east and breed in the southeast, and then their offspring continue to move north. So there's kind of this south to north progression of generations of monarch butterflies. And you kind of want to know what's happening in each of those regions to understand what's driving the population sizes of this species. So these sectors are relevant because if we want to say what is the trend of the monarch butterfly, well, do you mean continentally? So that's one question. Or do you mean in the Northeast region? So that's another question. Maybe here they're stable, but here they're declining, so that affects what sort of conservation actions you're going to take in each of those places. Then I'll tell you just a little bit about the field protocol so you have kind of a sense of what's actually being measured. Um, again, 
supplement or substitute your own study plot if you prefer. Um, but in this case, we're monitoring kind of four main things. One is what is the density of milkweed, and that's measured by setting a series of transects across your study plot and then monitoring subplots where you put down a little frame and you count the milkweed within the frame, and that's your, that gives you your density of milkweed plant per square meter on, on your study plot. And then when you're counting those plants, you're also checking them for monarch eggs. You can say how many eggs are there per plant. And then either before or after you do your milkweed transect, whoops, sorry. Um, you walk the perimeter of your plot and then extend it kind of awkwardly into the middle to get a 500 meter long walk for counting monarch butterflies, adult monarchs. Oh, and then also while you're doing your milkweed transect in each of those subplots, there's a measure for how many flowering plants are present in that subplot. Not just milkweed, which the caterpillars eat the leaves of the milkweed, but also other flowering plants because the adults require the nectar from those flowers <laughs> that they eat. And there's a thought that maybe on fall migration, maybe those adults are being limited by how much nectar is available. It's a thought we really don't know. So, not only are we taking continentally, we're also measuring a lot of things while we're out there. And we've done a power analysis that suggests we need to monitor 400 to 800 sites for about 10 to 15 years before we can start to answer these questions of what is the trend in adult monarchs and milkweed. And we have no hope of detecting a trend in eggs because they're very hard to find because they're clean. So that's 400 to 800 sites per region, that map that I showed is the region. If you want to know the trend in each region, you need 400 to 800 sites per region. And it's also per land use sector. And is there a question? So, so if, if eggs, eggs are hard to find, why are you including egg density but not the uh, caterpillar? Right, um, actually caterpillar density is something that will be monitored. So people will record that as okay. well. Um, it's something that I haven't worked with those data that much because even though caterpillars are easier to find than eggs, you need too many eggs to get one live caterpillar. And so you end up having a larger sample of eggs than of caterpillars. So we, would, we definitely wouldn't be able to detect the trend in the number of caterpillars that you find either. That would be even smaller. All right, and then so land use sector, I haven't mentioned yet, um, but since we're kind of looking for information on what conservation actions we can take. Of course, the actions you can take on a roadside are different than the actions you can take in a protected grassland versus private land like a cornfield. You know, there's, there's only so much you can do in each of those sectors. So we've stratified our area of interest into six land use sectors. Um, for today, I'm just going to focus on protected grasslands because that's where we have the most pilot data help inform the analysis that I'm going to talk about. All right, so that's what you do when you get to the site. In terms of how you choose the site, um, we're using the GRIPS algorithm to select our sampling site. Um, we're following the master sample that the North American Bat Monitoring Program developed, which you'll hear about later today, I think. And I'm not going to get into this today, but in it, so the the master sample is a grid of 10 by 10 kilometer cells across the contiguous U.S. There's also one for Canada and Mexico. And so those 10 by 10 kilometer cells are ranked. You say you want to go to number one first. But 10 by 10 kilometers is a pretty big area. So if you have someone go sample somewhere in there, they're going to say, oh, great, I'm going to go to that park where I know I can access that really easily. And I know there's much, there's milkweed there. So that would be a great place. So within that 10 by 10 kilometer cell, to direct sampling in an unbiased way, we've also done a second stage where we've divided that cell to much smaller points and ranked those with a secondary grid straw. To say, okay, within that cell, try to go to this point first, that doesn't work because of that one and so forth. So today I'm going to pretty much ignore that kind of two stage design and just focus on. Um, how we're selecting the master cells, for example. 
and then how we're bringing all those data back into the analysis. All right, so because this is continental and many land use sectors in a long period of time, and we don't have any funding for that, we're going to be relying on volunteers. So this is where citizen science comes in. And luckily, monarchs, <coughs> monarchs are charismatic, they're visible, they're easily identifiable. Everybody knows what a monarch is, even people who have never seen one. He's everybody I've ever talked to. So they have a history of attracting volunteers for citizen science programs. So we're relatively optimistic that we can get people involved in this, and that's some of our partners' jobs. I don't have to do that personally, luckily. But the point is, you need to get volunteers engaged. So the, the monitoring coordinators will be working to recruit volunteers and retain volunteers, and they'll ask the volunteers to go to, okay, here's a list of sites. These are the top 10 sites we want sampled in your region. Sign up for one of those sites. But you're going to get people who say, that's nice, but I actually really want a sample in my backyard, in my milkweed patch, or at this local park, or on my friend's property that I know I can access. So do we say no, and then not use those data? Or do we say yes, and then somehow deal with integrating those into the analysis? Of course, we'd like to say yes, there's lots of benefits to that. But then what do you do to make sure that your result is not biased? And that's the point of my talk. All right, so we know that if a volunteer selects a site, again, you can think about a targeted site that you've been monitoring for 20 years because it's whatever, it's got some characteristics that made you targeted. We know that those sites are going to be biased. Um, so example, for, for example, we're working with some pilot data from the Monarch Larva Monitoring Program. Now, as the name suggests, the program is meant to monitor larvae. And monitor larvae only So that program does measure milkweed density, but you do not have a single site in that program where there's no milkweed. So that's not really representative of the landscape. And then kind of a different story is if you want to look at adult monarchs, the pilot data that we're using are from e butterflies. Which if you're not familiar with that, it's a lot like eBird, where Anybody can go out, make some observations, and submit those to this website. So it's not very standardized in terms of effort or method. And again, people are choosing where to go and where to submit these data from. But e butterfly is a little bit different than when we're just going out and targeting monarchs. The people contributing to e butterfly probably care about all butterflies, so they might target places with high diversity of butterflies. They might be in, in habitats where there's not a lot of monarchs. We have kind of filtered out the habitats that we think are unsuitable for monarchs to try to eliminate that variation a little bit. But there's still some variation. So, oh, I forgot to define my abbreviation. But, so we've got design-based sites, which I'll abbreviate with CV, and then volunteer select sites, or DS. So, in your volunteer selected sites for milkweed, for the monarch, monarch larva monitoring program, there's always milkweed. For the design based sites that we've monitored with some pilot data, there's often milkweed because we are targeting habitats. Um, and again, this is for protected grasslands only, um, so not including agriculture or anything else. And there's often milkweed, but not always. Um, and then for e butterfly data, with the volunteer selected site, about 40% of the time they're seeing a monarch. Whereas with our design based sites, where we're pretty specifically targeting monarch habitat, right time of year, again, you filter out as much as you can from the volunteer data, but probably there's still more noise there. Also, the volunteers with e butterfly, they're not specifically looking for monarchs, so they might see this really interesting tiny little moth that's on plant. They're focused on that. Well, if honor flies by, they don't even see it. That's not what they're there for. So, the biases. Um, also, when milkweed or monarch, adult monarchs are present, at the volunteer selected sites, they tend to measure higher densities of those than the design based sites. 
more milkweed, more monarch, more butterflies, that's why they're there. Another interesting thing, which has been the source of contention in the monarch field, is that, like I said, if you look at the wintering populations when they're hibernating, in Mexico there's been a decline of about 4% per year. It's pretty dramatic, and even just in the, upper, in the upper Midwest where monarchs are pretty, used to be pretty common, we talk to people who are not biologists and they say, yeah, you know, I saw way more monarchs when I was a kid. So, it's, you know, it's a noticeable decline. But if you look at data from only these volunteer selected sites, like the butterfly sites, they show no trends in abundance of monarchs. So why is that? Well, you're you're choosing to go to a site that you think is pretty good, that you can access, it's probably protected, it's probably stable, the butterflies probably like it there, they're going to keep using it, even if butterflies disappear from other areas that, that you're not monitoring. So that's a major consideration if you want to monitor trends in the species. All right, so like I said, we need about 400 to 800 sites per whatever unit we're interested in to detect this trend of 4% decline per year that, that we pretty much know is happening in this population. So ideally, we would take all those from a grid sample. We almost certainly cannot do that. So what combination do we need of these design-based sites versus volunteer selected sites? Is there a point where you get too many volunteer selected sites and that's biased in your estimate? So what can you do about it? So to answer this question, um, I'll show you some simulations that I did um, using some pilot data that we have, like I said, from the Monarch Larva Monitoring Program as well as the Butterfly. And I wanted to show you here that there's also some issues of spatial balance and representation in the pilot data. So, you know, the pilot data are not perfect, that's why we need this monitoring program. Um, but they're all we have to work with right now. So in here, here in these maps, the blue points are where we've got design-based sites, where someone tried to representatively sample the landscape, not always according to grit, but something similar. And then on the left, the green points are where we have data for milky from volunteer selected sites. Um, that's from MLNT. And then on the right, the orange points are where we have data for adult monarchs from e butterfly. And you can see there's, I mean, nothing about that is representative, right? There's clustering where, like, Vermont apparently decided to put all of their state butterfly surveys into e butterfly or something like that. A lot of data there. Um, so we can't just, and then uh, most of our design based sites are clustered in these areas that. We think are really important for monarchs like the upper Midwest and then this migration corridor through Texas. So if we just try to compare the blue points to the orange points, there's be some obvious problems there. So what I've done for this analysis is dramatically pared down how many data that we can include, which is a little disappointing, but so it goes. And I'm focusing on the upper Midwest where we've got blue points and green points and slightly sparse orange points. And just to emphasize, this is not what we want it to look like eventually. <laughs> we hope to eventually have point, you know, spatially balanced throughout the whole continent. But this is what we're working with right now. All right, so this is a simulation study where I took those pilot data to represent, you know, what is the density and the probability of occurrence and um, the variances and the interannual variance and the trends for volunteer selected sites versus design-based sites. And I used those means and variances to simulate data sets and said, okay, in this scenario, 10% of them will be volunteer selected. And in this scenario, 50% of them will be volunteer selected. And what are the consequences of that? And then, I can't remember where I talked about this, but after simulating the data, I fit a General, generalized linear mixed model to it to estimate the mean density and the trend. So 
Let's catch out the model on the next slide. We'll show you the model on the next slide. But also, another key point is that this is a weighted regression. So we can apply different rates, different weights to the volunteer selected site. I assume that in this case, design based just meant it follows the grid selection. And if a volunteer happens to select a site that's a top priority grid site, that's still design based, is what we call it ultimately. But the volunteer selected sites are below our top 600 grid sites that we really want to sample. So we can downweight them so that they're not influencing our estimates as strongly. So I tried a few different levels of weight for this. Um, first, looking at the inverse of the grid strength, which works out to the mean of 0 0.0003, so that's a very small weight. And then trying some other weights as well. Um, also including a weight of one so that we can see if we don't downweight what happens. All right, so just to look at how the model is structured, um, the response is the density of either milkweed or adult monarch in a given group, so that's the site type, the volunteer selected versus design base, in a given year at a given site. Um, we've done some simulations where you visit a site repeatedly to survey it multiple times, and the number of times you visit doesn't have a huge effect on your results. Um, but we have seen for this that if you visit it three times, and then you take the results from those three and average them to get this value for each year and each site. Take a lot of that, and then you estimate the intercept with a random effective site. Some sites will just inherently have more milk than others. Um, well, I guess that's correct for that on there, but the intercept is also allowed to vary by group type. So, oh no, let's see. All right, so there's an effect of group on the intercept. And you can say the volunteer select sites probably have a higher density than the design based sites, and that term allows that intercept to be increased for that group. And the baseline group is the Design-based site. That's the estimate we really want. We assume that's the true estimate, so that's what the model will fit out for the intercept. And then there's also you want to detect a trend if there is one, right? So we've got an effective year on the density as well. And in this case, we've got some pilot data to say we think that the trend would be different if you estimated it from volunteer selected sites versus design-based sites. Um, so you could allow that trend effect to vary by the site type. In this case, I didn't do that to kind of say, what if we didn't know that, or what if we didn't believe that was actually true? What's going to happen? Whereas the intercept, we assume that there is this underlying difference between the two site types. All right, so with that approach, we're intending to evaluate kind of what happens under different scenarios of your proportion of volunteer selected sites in terms of is your estimate of density or trend biased? And can you use one of those scenarios to improve the precision of the estimate, reduce the variance, and therefore maximize your power to detect the trend? You've got a lot of variance, you won't be able to detect a significant trend. And our hope was that we can find some balance where we can utilize volunteer selected sites, we can get an estimate of density that's not biased and has pretty good precision, and we can get an estimate of trend that is not biased and has pretty good precision. And again, we're, we're varying the total number of sites, the proportion of those that are volunteer selected, and then also how we're weighting those volunteer selected sites in the analysis. All right, so there's a lot of plots here, but they follow the same pattern. This top row is looking at milkweed density, bottom row is looking at adult monarch. Uh, each of these columns shows the different weight that we put on the uh, volunteer selected site. And then on this plot, it doesn't really matter because they're all the same, but these different colors and sizes of squares show you the total sample size. So it could be up 400 sites up to 1,000 sites. And then on the x-axis, we've got the proportion of those sites that were volunteer selected. So you'll notice over on the right hand side, these points always look pretty different. Those are 100% volunteer selected. We have no design based sites. 
the model cannot give you a good estimate of the true density, what we think is the true density, which we expect, right? But all the other points follow this line, which you can't even see because all the points are on top of it, and that line is showing you what is the true density. So this fairly simple model is doing a pretty good job of producing an unbiased estimate of density, even if you have up to 90% of your site being volunteer selected, even though we know that those sites are biased, uh, the model can still estimate the intercept just for the design-based group pretty well. And you do see, and we'll look at this on the next slide a little bit more too, you'll see that the variance is increasing a little bit as you increase the proportion of volunteer selected sites. So there's a penalty for that, but it's pretty minor. Uh, we can see that a little bit more maybe on this plot where you get a lot of volunteer selected sites, your variance goes up for estimating adult monarch density. Um, all right, so here we're just looking at the variance or the standard error of the density estimate. Um, so this is what was in those error bars on the previous plot, but just showing a little bit more clearly. Um, also, this is reversed a little bit here. So the different points are the different proportions of volunteer select sites, and then on the x-axis we have the total number of sites. So this and we still got the weight here. So this is showing that increasing the total number of sites definitely helps reduce your variance, which you expect. <coughs> and then the proportion of volunteer selected sites that you have also have some effect on the variance where it's higher if you've got a lot of volunteer selected sites and it's lower if you've got fewer. And the surprising thing to me here was that, well maybe it's not surprising, but as you change the weight, these values aren't really changing that much. Maybe you can kind of pick out some very small changes, but not really changing. And so as you're estimating that intercept just for the design-based group, having more of your volunteer selected sites is not hurting that estimate of the intercept just for the design-based group because they are two separate estimates. So all right. So Emily, you're just back transforming the uh, estimate for the design-based intercept, right? You've got, and so the sites are all related to um, the uh, citizen science locations, is that right? But I, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding what, what you back transformed here. Sure. So we've got some sites that I simulated as volunteer sites. Um, that's the the proportion is shown here, so we've got zero versus 20% versus 50% versus 90% were volunteer selected. And then the rest of them were design based. All those are forming the model, but then the model is just estimating, well, the intercept that the model estimates is only for the design based group, because then it's got that term to adjust for the, for the volunteer selected group. So then, yeah, I'm taking that intercept for the design based group and back transforming that. This one's actually on the log scale, um, but the last slide is on the natural scale. Kathy? So, so I, th I think I'm following. So, are you putting in the data contributor as like a fixed effect? Yeah. Okay. And then how are you incorporating the weights? I kind of missed that part. In your um, GLMM? Yeah, in the GLMM. So, I'm using the LME4 package in R, which allows you to put an argument in there for what the weights are. And so the weights for the design-based groups, I just always put it one, and then the weights for the volunteer selected group so it's varying depending on the scenario. Yeah. So I'm just doing a quick sort of visual comparison here. And I was comparing the little black squares, which is no volunteer selected sites. Um, those, yeah, those are no volunteer. And the, and the little red squares, and bigger red squares, which mm -hmm. are half and half. Mm -hmm. And to my eye, at least, if you jump between 200 and 400 total number of sites, and you compare the little black ones with 200 sites, and the little red ones at 400 sites, which is the same number of grits samples in both cases, right, 200 in both, I don't actually see any difference 
between where they fall on the y-axis, regardless of the weighting, which to me says that actually the uh, the volunteer selected sites don't make any difference. Right. Yeah, at least for the variance. At least for the variance. Here. And yeah. if we were to go back, would we find the same thing for actually for, the answer? For, okay. most, of the for most of it, it doesn't make any yeah. difference. So, right. so that kind of raises the obvious question. I mean, it's a feel-good exercise to get volunteers out there collecting them. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it doesn't make any difference to your results, at least by this simulation. Yeah, at least for the mean density. We'll start to see on the next couple of slides. Um, okay. Some cases where it is helpful. Okay. Um, I think we have a question from, from the interwebs first. Yeah. Uh, how do DB sites work for design-based estimators when they are a non-random or non-grid order? Uh, so set up a design site. Are you treating them as if they are an IIT random sample or am I missing So for this simulation, we're assuming that the design-based sites follow our grid sample exactly. So that's the top. Or if we're including 200 design based sites, then that's one through 200 on our grid split. Um, obviously, that's not always going to be the case, but that's kind of the best case scenario that we're simulating here. All right, so that's for mean density estimates. Let's go ahead and look at what happens with the trend. So, here, remember, I'm using a little bit of a naive model where we don't tell it. That the trend might be different between these two groups. So here we're starting to see some more biases. Um, these are set up the same way as that first set of plots, where here now we've got trend on the y axis, we've got different weights in each of the columns, milkweed on top, monarchs on bottom, proportion of volunteer selected sites on the x axis, and then the different dots are showing you the different total numbers of sites. And again, these dash lines, which you can actually see now, that shows us our true value of trend in this case, which is that minus 0.04. And here we can see if we weight according to the, the inverse of the grid strength, so that's, that's really down with weighting the volunteer sites, then our trend estimate pretty much matches what we know. Um, except, of course, if you don't have any design-based sites, in which case it's only being informed by the volunteer selected sites, which are biased. Um, bias down for milkweed and bias up for adult monarchs. And then if you increase the weight, you start to see more bias, even if you've got a relatively small proportion of volunteers selected sites. Um, so we did not see this increase in the bias with the higher weight for the mean density estimate, again, because the model was kind of separately estimating densities for the volunteer selected versus the design based site. Here it's just using all of them. So we can see more of an effect. Um, another thing which we can start to see on this plot is some of these points are open circles. And those are the ones where we did not have enough power to detect that trend as being significantly different from zero. So we want to know not only what is the mean and what is the variance, but also can we actually say this population is declining, which we know it is. I built that into the simulation. So in these cases where you've got open points, that's not a successful monitoring scenario because you can't detect that trend. So that's kind of an additional consideration, um, which we can start to see here. And I think we'll see that a little bit better on the next plot. Oh boy, those are really light though. I don't know if you can see these, these blue points very well in the back. Can. A little bit, okay. So you can see a lot of open points here in this row the blue point. So for monitoring monarchs, if you weight the volunteer selected sites really heavily equal to the design based site, then that really interferes with your ability to detect that trend as being significantly different than zero. That gets a little bit better as you reduce the weight, you know, some of those points are filling in. Um, Great, so I wanted to get back to the question about are the volunteer selected sites actually improving anything? So if you go back to the, the mean estimate of trend, um, adding volunteer selected sites makes it worse if you weight them highly. You don't want to do that. Um, if you weight them pretty conservatively, um, then that might 
got a little bit of, a, of an effect on the variance. So, let's see. Why is it opposite from the sweet person? All right, so you want your variance to be lower, and that's why the, the dash line is at zero. So for milkweed, at least, if you've got, oh, but that's proportion. All right, hang on. Yeah, it, it helps. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> so we've got, right, so adding volunteer selected sites will increase the total number of sites, which will reduce your variance. I'm taking that a lot here. But having a higher proportion of volunteer sites isn't necessarily helpful, and in a mean estimate, that can actually cause problems. I mean, ideally, you would have no volunteer selected sites, they would all be So, adding volunteer selected sites to increase the total number of sites, I think in this case it does help because, uh, let's see. So, if you look at the green dot at 200. 200 total sites and all of them are, are design based. And then look at 400 for the red dot. 400 for the red dot. It's lower. Yeah, it is lower. All right, so in this case, adding volunteer sites to increase your total sample size is helpful, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> there might be something wrong with that wasn't the case. All right, any questions on the trend side of things? I'm just going to wrap up on the next slide. Brian? So, a couple questions. First of all, your, um, your weights. Um, there are a couple kinds of weights which could be offered into a GLM, right? And one is the sampling way, the other one has to do with the, the, the response itself. So I presume you're using the first, right? Is there a, is there a choice in. There's not a choice in LME4, then I just did whatever they do. Oh, <laughs> I don't know what that is. So another question has to do with, I mean, this, why can't you have um, two trend estimators? You like definitely you do with, could. It, with, the, with the intercept. Yeah, yeah, you definitely could. That's really easy to add to the model. Um, in this case, I kind of wanted to see what the consequences were if we didn't, if we either didn't realize there was a difference in the trend, or if we didn't realize that there was a difference in the trend, or like some of the debate in the literature about why are they stable on the breeding grounds but declining in the overwintering areas? Um, you know, I would argue that's an artifact of where they're sampling. But if you didn't believe that, then you would just assume that all of your sites, regardless of how they were selected, would follow the same trend. And so we could get a plot that looks much better than this, I think, if we, if we allow the trend to vary by group. Um, but if you don't, I kind of wanted to show what are the consequences if we don't do that. <coughs> All right. So to summarize uh, what we just saw in those graphs, um, including a fixed effect of the site type, the volunteer selected version design date on the intercept seemed to work pretty well to provide accurate estimates of mean density that also had pretty reasonable variances, even when we had a really high proportion of volunteers selected sites. Um, and then in this naive model where I didn't allow the trend to vary by the site type, if we had a low to moderate weight on the volunteer selected sites, we still got really good trend estimates. Um, with higher weights or with equal weights, and we started seeing some pretty serious problems in estimating the trend. And then also the power to detect that trend improves as you increase your total sample size. And also if you have a higher proportion of design-based sites. And a smaller effect, but also if you have lower weights for those volunteer selected sites, then you're improving your power. All right, and then my question for discussion. Um, this seems like a pretty simple approach to me, but it also seems to work pretty well. I would love to hear any thoughts on how to improve it, um, other than you know, adding that group effect on the trend. Um, or if you've got problems with it, or, or you know, anything we can improve. We're, we're wrapping up this analysis, so it's a great time to get feedback in terms of how we can help guide this monitoring program. And then one thing I've completely ignored so far is that 
volunteers not only collect different sites, in some cases they're implementing totally different monitoring protocols, and they're also presumably have some different level of experience than a state observer who might undergo some standardized training. Um, for this program, the intent is to have all the volunteers attend a day of training. But if you can't make it to the training, you just read the materials on the web and you can post that data. So there's some inherent differences in terms of what will be observed and recorded in the field as well. And then we don't have the data to disentangle that right now, but I wanted to just bring that up as a viewpoint for discussion or just consideration when working with these types of data. And maybe that's something that's less relevant for like targeted sites or legacy sites that were monitored by professionals as well. So, any thoughts, any <laughs> suggestions or warnings? Yes. 